To discuss, we're joined by Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who is the director of the Centre for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa and as South Africa's former preeminent advisor on COVID-19. I will also ask him about a dreaded fifth wave. Professor, thank you for being with us as always. How excited are you personally by this breakthrough, uh, seemingly a breakthrough in the US? Very good evening. Good evening to the viewers. I have to say that this uh, third individual who now has what is an apparent cure, I remember we don't have a definition of cure, so we don't say somebody is cured, we say they are apparently cured or we think they are cured, um, is, represents uh, a, a step, a small step. It's not a major advance in that what it represents is a technology that is experimental. This is not something that can be rolled out or something that's going to be made available. Just to give you some context for that, the first two individuals who were cured or functionally cured were the Berlin patient and the London patient. And both of them had bone marrow transplants where their original bone marrow, the original cells in the bone marrow were ablated were killed and then we had they had these transplants in this particular woman the difference is that when they ablated her cells they replaced it with stem cells and that's the difference between what we saw previously with what we see now now uh, from a point of view of you know what what did, what did it take for her to get this she had whole body radiation she had chemotherapy. You know, it's not something we're going to be doing for others in any time soon. So it was an experiment in this individual. All right. So given the, the cost and, and what somebody like her has to go through, you're saying it's not widespread. Uh, it's, it's said that this is part of the roadmap to where we're going, but, but we're a long way uh, from, from where we want to be. It, it is interesting because they say that uh, previously the, the bone marrow donors were predominantly white. Uh, so now the this, this stem cell um, uh, transplant at least uh, broadens the, the scope for, for people of other races. Is that correct? Yes. So let me take you one step back. So the essence of how all three patients were functionally cured is that in their bodies, the researchers replaced the original cells with cells that do not allow HIV to enter them. Now, let me just explain that. On the human cells, on CD4 cells, there is a receptor called CCR5. Now, that receptor is essential for HIV to enter in most cases. There are some instances where it uses other receptors, but CCR5 is really important to the virus. Now, there are individuals who have a genetic mutation. That is something they just inherited. It's called a delta 32 deletion on the CCR5 gene. So their CCR5 gene is abnormal. And because it's abnormal, their CCR5 receptor is abnormal and HIV can't enter the cell. So those individuals will not get HIV. The trouble is there are very few of them in that situation. There are very few individuals with this genetic mutation. And they are predominantly white. They're, this genetic mutation is quite rare in the black population. So that's what is being raised by these researchers, that generally these uh, studies have been done with white donors because that's where you will find this gene. Now, in this particular woman's case, they gave her two sets of stem cells. The first is stem cells that they took from the umbilical cord. So they took in a in a in a in a in an umbilical cord, they took stem cells from there that have this genetic mutation, and they supplemented it with one of her relatives who gave stem cells, and that relative also had this genetic mutation. So can you see how complicated it was just for her? 
to get all these stem cells, to get all of this treatment. And so it's a very unusual thing. What's exciting about it is that they didn't have to do a bone marrow transplant, that they could just use stem cells. It opens a new avenue of research on how to use stem cells to replace the body's CD4 positive cells. All right. Well, hopefully it'll lead to more open doors and, and breakthroughs. Uh, thank you for, for that, Professor. Let's talk about COVID-19 now. Firstly, about where we are. So we're a country uh, with about 60 million people. Yesterday, the death toll from COVID-19 was seven. Uh, that's still not ideal, but it is so fractional. Many more people are dying of, of other things in South Africa right now. Would you agree that in terms of the pandemic, we're in a pretty good place? Well, that's without question. You've hit it on the head. We now know, because we've had, you know, we've been living with this virus now in South Africa for two years. We now know that we have a period of about three months, 94 to 99 days, between waves. And it has been consistent between the waves that we've had. So once a wave comes to an end, which in our case, Omicron came to an end about two weeks ago, we now have about three months in which we will have low transmission. The virus is still around, it doesn't disappear, but uh, infection rates remain very low, even in the absence of most of the restrictions. So we have this, you know, call it what you like, I call it a honeymoon period, call it a low transmission period. We have this period, and during that period, we can ease restrictions to quite a significant extent uh, without being too concerned that we might see you know, a whole new outbreak. We don't, we don't know why we have this three-month break. We think it might be related to immunity from the previous wave because the antibodies sort of wane, you know, after about two to three months. Or it might be just our behavior has changed. We don't fully understand that. But we have been seeing it fairly consistently that we have a three-month period. Then we have to expect that we are likely to see a new wave occur because that's this 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 three month break precedes a new wave and that wave because every one of our four waves was driven by a new variant we can expect that we are likely to see a new variant what that variant looks like nobody knows is it going to be mild like omicron or is it going to be severe like we saw with delta we don't know. Nobody can predict that. Nobody predicted Omicron. Nobody is in a position to know what those variants are going to be because each variant evolves independently. They're unrelated to past variants. So we, at this stage, can ease many restrictions, but we need to be prepared that we may go into a fifth wave roughly at the end of April. All right. Uh, not great news, but in the interim, you say dropping restrictions. Uh, how far should that go? Should we be like the UK and say you don't have to wear masks and live our lives until it comes back and, and then start the cycle all over again? Well, I'm not in that school of thought. I believe that you know, we need to ensure that we're not creating a situation where the virus could very quickly get out of control. So there are three key things that we have to ensure we're keeping in place at some level. And the first is that indoor activities need to be controlled. The number of individuals allowed, in, you know, for example, controlling the gathering size, that's going to be important. That's the first. The second is ensuring that in indoor activities that most of the individuals or all of the individuals are vaccinated so that you restrict entry into indoor activities to vaccinated only people. And then we have to ensure that in indoor activities that people wear masks. So masks remain mandatory in indoor activities, but the outdoor masks can be dropped. The sanitizing can be dropped. There are many other things that can be dropped. But indoor activities present such a risk that controlling their size to some extent, ensuring masks and restrictions of to vaccinated only people because 
in many indoor activities, you also have to take your masks off, for example, in a restaurant or in a gym. And so being vaccinated becomes really important. All right, well, let's chat again around April, if not sooner. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Salim Abdul Karim.